It Chapter 2 follows the success of 2017's It, selling an enormous number of tickets and increasing the popularity of sexy Pennywise Halloween costumes. Bill Skarsgård once again plays the role of Pennywise. Much in the same way that Gene Wilder's performance of Willy Wonka became iconic, Bill Skarsgård's rendition of Pennywise is now how we picture that character. However, the breakout cast of children from the first movie was replaced by Hollywood veteran actors, including James McAvoy, Jessica Chastain, Bill Hader, and the Old Spice Guy. Hello, ladies. It Chapter 2, and I will be getting into spoiler territory from here on out picks up 27 years after the events of the first film. It has returned, and Mike, the only person who remained in Derry, calls the rest of the Losers Club to fulfill their promise of killing It if it ever came back. If it isn't dead, if it ever comes back, we'll come back too. The gang all return except for Stanley, who commits suicide upon hearing of It's resurgence. Mike tells the group about the ritual of Chud, a Native American ceremony that has been used to fight It hundreds of years ago. Each member of the Losers Club must collect a totem of sentimental value to be used for the ceremony. It takes a sordid opportunity to attack them while they're split up. Eventually, they all collect their totems so that they can complete the ritual of Chad, and they descend below the town of Derry to defeat It, who, true to form, fucks with them along the way. Once they reach It's lair, they try to perform the ritual of Chungus, but unfortunately it doesn't work. Mike neglected to tell everyone that the last time the ritual of Chia Pet was performed, It killed them all. Eventually, the gang learns to overcome their fears, just as they did when they were children, and since It draws its power from fear, they're able to kill It in its weakened form. Unfortunately, Freddy dies during the final battle, but the other members of the Losers Club survive and go back to their lives knowing they've killed It once and for all. I thought It Chapter 2 struggled with its pacing, and it was kind of annoying to see them spend the entire movie trying to relearn what they already knew from the first movie. I also thought that there were several better ways to beat It that would be faster, cause fewer deaths, and ultimately be a lot less risky than what's shown in the film. I've devised three devious ways to defeat It in a clinical and calculated manner, each one more confirming of my genius than the last. But before we can beat it, first we need to go over the conditions of the scenario so that everyone knows the same facts and we can consider how to beat it while being as informed as possible. The film takes place in 2016, 27 years after the events of the first film, which took place in 1989. This number is significant because it wakes up every 27 years to feed on the children of Derry. The film takes place in the town of Derry, Maine. It takes the losers only three days to beat it. On the first day, Mike calls them all to return. On the second day they assemble in Derry, and on the third day they defeat it. Our goal will be to kill it in as few days as possible, because the longer it remains alive, the more people it will kill. Let's talk about its powers and abilities. It can make those who encounter it forget about it once they leave the city, but not entirely, as the main characters do start to recover their memories once they return to their hometown. Now that we're all here, everything just comes back faster, faster, I mean all of it. We learn early on that Mike is the only member of the Losers Club to remember the events of the first film, apparently because he never left the town of Derry. Something happens to you when you leave this town. The farther away, the hazier it all gets. But me, I never left. I remember all of it. Another psychic power it has is the ability to control the minds of the adults in town to make them completely uncaring and unworried about the children who go missing. This has more relevance in the first film, but it seems that it has been able to manipulate the people of Derry to turn a blind eye to its diabolical deeds. This is best illustrated when Beverly's father can't see that the bathroom is covered in blood, but the other losers can. It is also able to produce visual hallucinations. During the final battle with it, Beverly gets trapped in a hallucination of a school bathroom, and Bill is sent back to the basement of his childhood home. It uses these hallucinations to manipulate and terrify its victims, but whether or not these are just hallucinations or are physically there and it has conjured them into existence is a matter worthy of debate. The characters certainly think they're not real and try to rid themselves of the illusion using this mantra. It's real, it isn't happening, it isn't real. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is evidence to support both arguments. When Freddy is fighting the leper, he realizes that he can kill it and his fear dissipates. In the same instant, the leper also disappears, but the goo he vomited onto Freddy remains, suggesting that the leper was actually there but disappeared when Freddy stopped being afraid. When Henry escapes the hospital, he gets driven around by the zombie of his old friend. But there's lots of evidence that these are just hallucinations. Right before the final confrontation, Pennywise cuts Mike with a piece of glass, but when Beverly smashes the mirror, the cuts disappear. In the Chinese restaurant scene, the gang is being attacked by all kinds of little ghouls, but they all vanish when a waitress walks into the room, making Mike seem like a crazy person. So what's going on here? Are these things real, or are they hallucinations? It seems to be a little bit of both. 
It is able to physically manifest things in order to scare and attack its victims, but it can also produce hallucinations, and it's impossible to tell which is which. A perfect example of this is that same bathroom scene from the first film. Is the blood real, and it is preventing Beverly's father from seeing the blood? Or are the losers sharing the same visual hallucination? There's no way to know for sure. To be on the safe side, we should move forward assuming everything shown to the main characters is real and capable of hurting them. Freddy found out while fighting the leper that its manifestations lose their power if the victim isn't afraid of them. So the trick to beating these manifestations is to not be afraid. This brings us to its favorite manifestation, Pennywise the Dancing Clown. According to Stephen King, it chooses the form of Pennywise most frequently because Stephen King couldn't think of anything that children hate more than clowns. There ought to be one binding creature, the kind of thing that just, oh, you just don't want to see that. You, it makes you scream just to see it. And I thought to myself, what scares children more than anything else in the world? And the answer was, wow. So it chooses the form of Pennywise as a general scare tactic. But if Pennywise is a manifestation, just like everything else seen in the films, then what is it physically? What exactly are we trying to beat? The answer is the deadlights. The deadlights are it, and everything else is just something that the lights have conjured. The good news, however, is that harming the physical manifestations also harms the deadlights. So in practice, attacking Pennywise or any of the other manifestations will kill it. All living things must abide by the laws of the shape they inhabit. The deadlights, despite being the physical form of it, aren't really all that important in trying to beat it, so the characters can just focus their efforts on defeating the manifestations. Another strange and somewhat vague ability it has is apparently being able to see the future. When Beverly is exposed to the deadlights in the first film, every night since, she has dreamed of the deaths that await her and her friends if they don't kill it once and for all. These appear to be premonitions, and Beverly gained some of the deadlights' powers by being exposed to it. Pennywise confirms this himself when he confronts Beverly in her old apartment. You haven't changed. You haven't changed their futures. It reveals his ability to see the future again when he correctly predicts that Bill won't be able to save this boy from death. Although, it could just be taunting Bill here and doesn't know for sure if it will succeed. In any case, its ability to see the future doesn't stop him from being defeated by the losers, so it doesn't really affect the scenario in any way. The movie just uses this as a motivation for the characters to confront it here and now, because if they don't, Beverly has seen that they'll all die in horrible ways. What Beverly sees, it will come to pass. It's what'll happen to all of us eventually, unless we stop it. Its final ability is to hypnotize its victims. Pennywise opens his mouth to channel the deadlights, which hypnotizes the victims so that it can eat them at its leisure. Its goal is to remain hidden under the town of Derry so that it can feed on children every 27 years, using its powers to keep the town unsuspecting. It produces manifestations to attack and terrify its victims. Fear makes its victims taste better, and it has been described as akin to salting the meat in the novel. So how do we beat it? Well, as the losers already discovered in the first film, it becomes powerless when- Oh shit! Honey? I'm home! What the hell? I guess we'll be back after these messages. So how do we beat It? Well, as the losers already discovered in the first film, It becomes powerless when its opponent is no longer afraid. And we learn in this film that It must abide by the laws of the shape it inhabits. All living things must abide by the laws of the shape they inhabit. So as we saw in the film, It can be defeated if you're not afraid and you picture it as a small helpless creature. The trick is doing so without just jumping down a hole and hoping for the best. Did you know that they didn't even bring any weapons with them? Beverly at least had the foresight, perhaps literally, to bring this piece of fence, but they didn't even bring like a baseball bat or like a gun, like nothing. It's like they wanted to die. What the characters need to do is eliminate the possibility of becoming afraid before entering its lair to prevent him from doing any harm, and that's what these three solutions aim to do. Mike is the key to all of them, because he's the only one who stayed in Derry and remembers everything that happened. In the film, he seems to be active in his search for any signs of it returning 
returning, even going as far as buying a police scanner. Mike then has 27 years to prepare for the return of It. He doesn't actually need the help of the other losers, and in fact it's probably better if they don't come at all. If Mike enters It's lair without any fear, he should be able to easily dispatch it by himself. But if the others come, their fear would give It strength. The first solution is for Mike to use those 27 years to their fullest and start attending Cognitive Behavior Therapy, or CBT. CBT is a technique used by psychologists to help those suffering from debilitating phobias, such as misophobia, fear of germs, or automatonophobia, fear of statues. It's also helpful for dealing with illogical or maladaptive beliefs, such as, for example, blaming yourself for your parents' death. CBT is an incredibly complex topic that would take far too long to explain in detail, but I would urge you to look into it yourself through this link. For our purposes, all you need to know is that CBT is an incredibly effective therapy technique for coping with irrational fears and beliefs. If Mike committed himself to eliminate all of his fears, over 27 years he would become incredibly resistant to any of its manifestations. Mike could stroll into its lair and rip out its heart the second he learns of its return. It should take Mike like I don't know, 20 minutes to defeat it? There are a number of problems with this solution, however. If Mike does go alone, even if Mike isn't afraid of Pennywise or any other manifestation, it could still paralyze him by using the deadlights. It would be ideal to have at least two people with a CBT skill set to confront it to prevent this from happening, but that would require one of the other losers staying behind in Derry so they don't forget. They may or may not be willing to do that. Look at your man. Now back to me. Now back at your man. Now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me. But if he helps me beat these three glowing lights from outer space, he could save the entire town of Derry. It isn't entirely foolproof, but decades of cognitive behavioral therapy would have given Mike a much better chance of beating it than what we saw happen in the film. Perhaps a much simpler solution than honing your mind to resist it would be to like, I don't know, get high, man, on prescription anti-anxiety medications to be specific, because there's significant evidence to suggest that these meds reduce the effects of fear on the mind and body. Xanax, Zoloft, Propranolol, and D-Cycloserine all show dramatic reductions of fear when treating phobias, PTSD, panic disorders, and anxiety disorders. Because IT Chapter 2 takes place place in 2016, the losers have a wide assortment of drugs available to them. These medications function by inhibiting different parts of the fear response, stopping the body or the mind from experiencing fight or flight. Decycloserine is the most interesting of the bunch because it has been shown to increase the extinction rate of the fear response. Basically, the more decycloserine is used, the less afraid the person becomes with each subsequent exposure to the fear stimulus. None of these drugs are perfect, but they all act act on the fear response in slightly different ways. As before, Mike doesn't really need the rest of the losers to defeat it. In the ideal scenario, Mike would go to a doctor and say he either has a debilitating phobia, such as a fear of heights, anxiety, or a panic disorder. Mike would very likely be prescribed either one of these drugs or something very similar. Then all he would have to do is go back in two weeks and say it isn't working, and ask to try a different drug instead, like for example, one of the ones we already spoke about. And boom, presto, fettuccine alfredo with pesto, now you have two drugs. Mike could keep doing this until he gets as many as he feels comfortable taking, and then take a course of all of them, and confront it when it wakes up. It would have a very difficult time getting Mike's fear response to activate, so Mike would be able to easily defeat it as it would have no power over him. But, as usual, there are a few downsides to this plan. A mixture of all these drugs would be ideal, but there's no guarantee Mike will be able to get his hands on all of them. A lot of these drugs also require a few weeks of daily use before they become completely effective, so Mike would need to time out the 27 year window correctly if he wants to confront it the moment he starts killing people. Remember, the losers managed to defeat it in just three days, so that's the time frame we're trying to beat. If Mike waits two weeks for the drugs to become effective after it wakes up, then lots of people will die in the meantime. And there is still the problem of the deadlights, so just like in the last solution, 
solution, Mike would need to bring someone with him and administer the same drugs to this person, just in case it manages to hypnotize one of them. Look down, back up. Where are you? You're in a sewer with the man your man could smell like. What's in your hand? Back at me. It's an oyster with two tickets to that thing you love. Look again. The tickets are now prescription drugs. The ideal solution would be to both undergo cognitive behavioral therapy and take a medley of anti-fear drugs for the best possible chance of defeating it with as little risk as possible. But the last solution is by far the best, and also the worst. You know how the amygdala is the part of the brain that helps regulate emotion? Well, this last solution is, drum roll please, it's a lobotomy! Come on down, because you just won a brand new lobotomy! Is your brain too heavy? Well, worry not, my cranium-loaded chum, because I've got that one neat trick that will solve all your problems! Believe it or not, but an amygdalectomy, or the surgical removal of the amygdala, is a real procedure that is sometimes performed in order to treat overly aggressive individuals. An amygdalectomy is considered a last resort and is rarely performed today, but it does happen. Happen. In 2017, an intellectually disabled teenage girl in China had this procedure done to reduce aggressive episodes. An interesting side effect is that after the procedure is performed, those with removed amygdalas are incapable of feeling fear. There is a rare genetic disorder called erbach wyeth disease which causes the amygdala to degrade, and these individuals also have no fear whatsoever and no other side effects. It would be completely helpless against someone who is biologically incapable of experiencing fear. If Mike were able to either have the surgery performed or enlist the help of someone with erbach wyeth disease, beating it would be a cakewalk. It is the best solution to defeating it, at least on paper, but practically it's also the worst. For starters, it would be incredibly difficult to find any surgeon willing to perform this surgery on a healthy person. And even if he did find someone, there's little chance he could pay for it on a librarian's salary. The other downside is that you would be living with permanent brain damage for the rest of your life. So, you know, there's that. If he chose to enlist the help of someone with erbach wyeth disease, it would also be a challenge, since there have only been 400 recorded cases since its discovery in 1929 and only half of those had damaged amygdalas. On the other hand, he has 27 years to prepare for its return, so it's possible Mike could get either of these things done. Again, you would need to bring a second person with you to circumvent the deadlights, so that means you actually need two people with amygdalectomies or erbach wyeth disease. But the worst downside by far is that removing the amygdala isn't actually 100% effective at removing an individual's fear. In 2013, researchers tested the fear response of individuals with bilateral amygdala damage and found that if they were made to breathe in CO2, they experienced panic attacks as the brain believed it was suffocating. The researchers postulated that damage to the amygdala removed the mechanism for external fears, such as spiders or bears for example, but did not remove the body's fear of internal threats such as suffocation. So although it would mostly be neutralized, it could still provoke a fear response by making the person drown for example. Not unlike the scenario that Bill had to face. So in closing, an amygdalectomy would be incredibly effective, but the list of downsides is enormous. But if you have a better idea and you think you know the perfect way to beat it, let us all know about it in the comments. Thanks for watching, and until next time, this has mostly been the Film Herald.